tower having couch conversations, but instead of being on a couch wearing chairs, I'm just honored to be here to share in um, my story with you, the viewers, and of course your tower. Thanks for having me, and one thing I want you to keep in mind, be mindful of your company, and always know that God is able. Never underestimate the power of God. He can do all things, but feel. Hey guys, welcome back to Couch Conversations with Shatara. I am extremely excited because this month's series is uncovered in the unspoken truth, beyond the lights and beyond the fame and beyond everything that the people can see. But the things that goes on within are the behind the scene things. And I'm so excited to have Miss Danielle Metz with us on the couch. I mean, once I found out who she was, I became obsessed over her and over her story. And so many of you guys um, did as well. And so I'm just super excited to have such a super woman here with us um, to share her story. So come on in as we dig deep with Miss Danielle. Thank you so much for having for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem. It's an honor. Yeah. <laughs> no, we are like legit. When I say we, I mean we. Like I put you on social media and I was like, you guys have any questions, um, any topics, you know, DM me, email me, and my DMs went crazy. You know, everybody, are, they're intrigued by you and your story, you know, um, to be 25 and to go away, you know, from not even have as, having as much as a traffic ticket. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that was, you know, harsh, the harshness of it, you know. So, right. I'm extremely excited to um, get into it. So, the first thing that I want to know is, who is Danielle? Who is Danielle Metz? Danielle Metz is powerful. Mm. That's how I describe myself, powerful, because, you know, even before this situation came about, I was always Danielle. So, you know, you can go around in the hood and ask about me. They know Danielle. So I didn't come into a situation where I got my status because of who I was with. I was already Danielle to begin with. You know, I came from a good background. My mom worked hard. My dad worked hard. And, you know, I just deterred away from that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, you know, I didn't come into things where I just looked up and met somebody that gave me everything. My father and my mother had already given me everything. Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I was trying to make it to the other side. The other you know, side. Yeah, the other side. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I guess, that's probably what most young girls, you know, you know how your mom tell you everything that glitter ain't gold? Mm -hmm. Well, I was seeing this, that glitter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it really wasn't gold. Help them out when you talk about the other side, because a lot of times, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head. You know, as parents, and even as a child, me, myself, knowing, you know, coming up, growing up as a child, I know what my mama told me to stay away from, but I know I went to it anyway, you know? And so knowing that, you know, that's when, no, when you say no, I don't go there, you know there's consequences for that. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, the other side for me was just like, um, I was raised uptown in the uptown area, and. We were surrounded by different projects like the Melfamina, Magnolia, the Calio, and most of the time when you're a young kid, you want to go where you are forbidden to go. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get in the Magnolia, I wanted to go in the Calio, uh -huh. I wanted to go in the Melf, because it seemed like that's where all the fun was going on, you know. And, um, to me, it didn't seem like the people that lived there had any restrictions, mm -hmm. where I was kind of restricted, restricted, restricted from doing this mm -hmm. and doing this, I, you know. So that's how my mother kind of raised me. So. You know, we were just forbidden. Not that it was a bad thing, but you know, most people that at that time lived in there, they wanted to be out, but I wanted to go in there. You yeah. know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah, you had the good life and you wanted to go and see what all of, all the other stuff was all about. You had a child at a young age. Tell us about that. Um, in 11th grade, when I was in high school, I attended Waltel Cohen. And um, in my senior year, I didn't come back because I became pregnant. So after I came, you know, after I became pregnant, I didn't come back, and um, I was kind of shamed and embarrassed, you know, because when I was in high school, that was the best years of my life, but then having a child, it takes on a different meaning. Mm -hmm. Now you're responsible for somebody else, mm -hmm. and you know, you have to take care of that child. Mm -hmm. Now, the things that, you know, where you didn't, you were carefree now, it's like you have big responsibility, and mm -hmm. raising a child is a big thing, you know, so. I just, you know, my dreams was kind of shattered because my dad, he always wanted me to be a nurse. He would tell me about becoming a nurse. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew I wasn't going to be a nurse at that point because now I'm a mother. You're a mother. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's basically what happened. What when happened? I became, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go back to school when then my life took on a different meaning. Mm -hmm. you know? And so you were, um, were you a single mother? Um, you know, how did that 
with the, with your child's father? Were you and him together, or you know something happened? No, my um, child's father. He was, you know, my first love. Me and him was going together since we were twelve years old. We were, you know, back and forward. And at one time, he used to. Um, he was going to Delta, and I was going to St. Monica. Mm -hmm. And he would catch the bus with me, and you know, to my house. And then he'd get off and catch the bus back because I wasn't supposed to have a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So we dated off and on, off and on, off and on. But um, he was my first love, and um, I just, you know. I was just happy to have a baby. You know, when you're young and you get to having the baby, you think you, you know, that's everything. You know, like you made it when you have the baby for him. Like y'all gonna be together forever. Yeah. But that that wasn't the case because um, although we had dated since we were 12 years old, he ended up getting murdered mm. when uh, my son was six months old. Oh wow. And that right there it was like devastating for me because you know, in our society we don't teach. You know, we don't know what grieving really is. We just go on to the next thing. The next thing. So even now as an adult and I look back, I was like, I had been through a lot. You know, just looking back like, I really been through a lot, but I don't, you know, I don't hang, hang up on it or mm -hmm. hold on to that. I just, you know, keep you going. just keep going. I mm -hmm. think, you know, people say, oh, you strong, you strong. But, you know, a lot of people don't know the scars that the things that I've been through has caused because Cause. you don't see that. Mm. You don't see mm -hmm. that. We don't get to see the scars. We don't get right. to see the, the, the tears. Mm -hmm. The tears, you know, sitting in prison for 23 years um, behind closed doors and respect is everything in prison. So when you come out there, you got to be ready like you could hold your own, mm -hmm. you know, but they don't know what happens in the inside when I'm crying and, the, you know, praying every night and asking God to give me one more chance. Like, mm. God, just give me one more chance, one more chance, please. And me being in there for so long, watching people just go home, it had gotten so bad. So people started leaving their belongings with me because they knew they would come back and they thought I would always be there. Be there. So they would just, just be like, go hold this for me. I, um, you know, hold my sweatsuit in case I come back. I don't know, but man, you already have my stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was like, they didn't think I would ever leave. Ever leave, yeah. So talk about it. Tell us about it. You went to, um, you got sentenced and you went to prison at the age of 25. No, 26. 26. At 26. 26. And at 26, you had two kids. Two kids. And so how old were they? They were seven and three when I became um well when I got when I went to prison they were seven and three when they were seven and three when you went to prison and so you left behind a toddler and you know like you left behind little kids they little wouldn't know kids. you know and these kids were used to their parent you know their mother right um tell us how did that feel what did you have to go through like I just want to know the emotion behind just that part well for me it was devastating because my kids had never they didn't know what life was without me. Mm -hmm. And now they had to take on a new meaning for life for themselves, you know. And um, when you have a kid three and seven and a grandmother raising, the grandmother can't do all the things that the parents do. Because my mom, she was well, you know, um, she was probably like 63, something like that when um, I went to prison. So of course she can't take all that time with the kids. She done the best that, that she, she could. could. Mm -hmm. but. It was just like, it was devastating for me because my kids, well, I was used to being with my kids every day. Mm -hmm. Even in whatever life I lived, my kids was always with me. And that was one thing that my dad kind of um, loved about me because he said whenever he saw me, I had the kids. Yeah, the I, didn't, I had never let my kids spend a night by my mother's house. Mm -hmm. Never. They had never been, you know, spent a night out anywhere because mm -hmm. I was just protective of them. Of your kids? Yeah. You was a mother mother. Like, you know, yeah. you was one of them, forget the clubs, forget the streets, it's yeah. me and my kids, you know. Right. And so let's back up a little bit. You went to prison um, off of drug charges, correct? Conspiracy. And so, conspiracy, conspiracy. And I just want you to give a little something to the, the women and the girls out there now who's looking at that life. And they see these guys out here that's selling drugs. And they see these guys out here driving the nice cars. And they got the big chains. And they got the goals in their mouth. And they got all of that. And they got the lights. And it look like that's the life they want to live. They want the red bottoms. And they want these bags. And, you know, give them a little bit of some reality of how, what it really is. Um, well, first of all, you can't paint reality black. You know, reality is reality. So when we in this lifestyle and we meet these guys, uh, you know, like when I met Glenn, you know, I had never had counter calls. All I saw was Glenn and what he had and what he could offer me and um, someone could help me take care of my son. You know, I didn't look at, okay, well, I'm going to end up in prison or something mm -hmm. like that. And um, for those who don't know, for the federal system, um, life means just life. I wasn't supposed to walk out there. I was supposed to leave out there in a pine box mm. because there's no parole. Mm. There's no good time. The life was getting nothing. You're mm. just there waiting 
calendar after calendar after calendar. So, you know, just be mindful of your company and um, know what you're getting yourself into because I, I really didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I liked it, what I liked it. I liked the good stuff. I like having nice clothes and I was always a nice dresser or somebody that was materialistic way before Glenn came became, you know, mm -hmm. I met Glenn. You know, I was always wearing Gloria Vanderbilt, Jordash, you know, my cashmere sweaters, my tam, you know, I mm -hmm. thought it was all about me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had to move into the next level of that, you know, my mom bought them kind of things for me, but, you know, I wanted more. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't appreciate my mom working hard as she did. And, um, you know, bringing home money, my mom had never been on um, housing or uh, no kind of assistance. Sister. She, had, she mm -hmm. I was the youngest of nine kids and she done a remarkable job, mm -hmm. you know, and now me coming home and um, after I came home seven months, after I came home, she died. Mm -hmm. So I, I asked myself, is it worth it? Was it really worth it because I wanted nice things? Or mm -hmm. I liked it, that lifestyle? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't mm -hmm. worth it, no. So, you know, I just want the young girls out there to know that you count the cost, you know, Know that there's consequences. Cause we do what we do, but we don't get to pick the punishment, the punishment. that's imposed yes. upon us. We don't get to say, well, just give me five years or just mm -hmm. give me six years. There's a such thing as sentences guidelines. Mm -hmm. There's a such thing as federal guidelines. Mm -hmm. Well, I had never had a traffic ticket. I had never been convicted of anything. It was my first offense. I was, you know, I didn't even know how the system worked. I was asking them to give me 20 years probation because that's how adamant I was about never doing anything again. In the uh, pre-sentencing investigation report, and said, I don't think you know the severity of what you was involved in. I was like, but you still could give me 20 years probation. I promise. I swear I ain't gonna do nothing else. Mm -hmm. Just give me one chance, you know, because I'm like, I'm a mother. Even when I ask the judge, you know, I say, can you give me leniency for my kids? And he told me, you know, that I had forfeited my right to live in a humane society. Mm. And I'm like, what? what? Yeah. And you know, I was awakened to those words every every night, like they they. That was in my head was every day. Head. That mm -hmm. was one sentence I would never forget. That he told me that. And I was like, well, I didn't murder anyone. You right. know, but that right there. So, you know, looking back where we from Louisiana, you know, now that I'm old and I'm seeing things under different lens, I'm like, that was straight up racism to me. Mm -hmm. To tell a young black girl that, you know, I have forfeited my right. That's you know, prison is about rehabilitation. It's not about punishment. You know, once you give me the sentence, then okay, but... That was a bit, that was cruel and unusual to me. Mm -hmm. Three life sentences in Plus 20, 20 years. years. And you, have you ever heard of that before? Right. You know, I'm just saying, it, it was yeah. just, it, and that, that stayed in my head forever. You know, I always could quote that off the top because I'll never forget when he told me that. Mm -hmm. you know, it really done something to me, kind of broke my spirit, kind of, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to keep on because I got to get to my kids. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let nothing and nobody be the hindrance of me getting back to my children. And that was my mindset going in. Going in. I told myself that um, if I never made it to the other side, it wasn't going to be for nothing that I did. Because mm. my whole objective was to go home once go I home. got in there. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. That's deep. That's really, really, really deep. So your whole, you had to shift your mindset to, okay, I got this punishment, mm -hmm. and so now I got to do what I need to do to get out, to get to my kids. You right. know, it was all right. about getting back to your children. Um, and so, a family member took took your kids, right, and was able to because you they didn't have a, the system for women out here in Louisiana, right? So they had to transport you to California. Correct. So you not only did you get this un cruel and unusual punishment of three life sentences plus twenty years, but you also was taken away from the environment. Right. All the people that you knew, you know, the people who could have came to see you and, you know, just to have that type of, at least have that relationship, you know, even though right. you're on the inside, you could still see those people and still have that thing going on, you know, from the inside, but you was taken away from Like family that. ties, you're saying. Like yeah. Family ties. Family, friends, you know, people know that, yeah. So it's like, no, that was my girl. You know, yeah. you know how I many people probably thought that, no, that was wrong. So they wanted to come and see you and come and support you, but that was stripped away from you because you was moved. Way. Across country. Yeah. yeah. And so you had your sister take care of your kids. Uh, she took your kids, and so you had that sense of normalcy to have your kids come by and see you. Um, what was that like for you? Um, well, you know, when you're in prison and you're a mother, and when you hear kids cry, it's a different cry when uh, 
you want in your, you know, want to be with your mother. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get in that visiting room at the end of the visit and the kids are yelling like, mommy, mommy, mm -hmm. they're breaking, you know, visiting over, go on one side, left, visitors on the left, inmates on the right, you know, that kind of thing. And the kids like, I want my mama, I want my mama, you know, that kind of thing. It's heartbreaking, you know, you're like, just like, and for me, it was really, because I couldn't ever tell my kids exactly when would when I you be would back. Mm -hmm. When would I be back? But my mom, again, she, every Christmas for 23 years, she was in that prison with me. But what I love about my mom is she taught me how to um, just deal with the consequences because um, me being her baby and I'm in prison and she watching me come in the visiting room and um, I would get ready to cry all the time. Mm -hmm. when she said, you're Don't not going to cry. She said, you know why? Because you did what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So I had to deal with that. You know, that was a, a hard pill to swallow yeah. right there, you know. She said, you did what you wanted to do. You didn't have that to do. She mm -hmm. said, so we gonna eat these chicken wings? Because I would tell her all the time, get all the chicken wings out the machine for me. Make sure I have 20 packs in my car. <laughs> so she said, you get the chicken, we eat these chicken wings. Because in her heart, I know she wanted to do something for me, but she but couldn't. But she couldn't. And she said, yeah. let God will be done. Mm -hmm. And I said, but you going home. She said, but you did what you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I said, all right, all right. That's all I could do because it's like she would have, you know, I would have broke her heart to sit there and cry the entire visit. Mm -hmm. But she, she, she made a woman out of me. Yeah, you know? I was just about to say that. That those words to you and what she said and what she stuff. Even while you was in prison, she still was being a mother, teaching you how to be a woman, right. teaching you, you right. know, because we what, have to be held accountable. Even when you go to court, uh, they tell you they want you to take accept responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was in denial for a long time, like, I ain't did nothing, mm -hmm. I ain't did nothing, I ain't did nothing. No, you have to be held accountable, you know, and it's consequences. So finally, you know, well, you have to remember, I couldn't even say I had a life sentence because, you know, like if I was having a conversation with other women, they would have like 120 months, which was 10 years, 240, which was 20, 20 years. 360, and then when it get to me, I run off because it was like, I couldn't even digest it. You know, I couldn't even say how much time. It was like, I don't know if I know I have this kind of time. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, I'll be right back. Just wait, you know, like, where she went to? You know, I didn't want anyone to know because you don't talk about your time in prison mm -hmm. because it's out of respect. If somebody want to tell you their time, then yeah. But they ran an article about my case and that's how everybody knew who mm -hmm. I was. You know, about, they said, you know the little girl? That girl got all this time, you know. And then I couldn't hide it anymore, but I could never say it because it would choke me up mm -hmm. every time I, I tried to talk about it. It mm -hmm. was just something I didn't want to hear. And they're not using it against me while we in there. That's going to be a problem. Yeah. You know, that's going to be a problem. Because they hit you where it hurt it, you know. Ooh. Oh, you ain't never getting out of here anyway. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. You know. That is, that, that's crazy. Just thinking about it, like, I just got teary-eyed. Just, just thinking about the fact that, you know, like, I can feel it. And one thing I said when I wanted to interview you was, I just wanted to feel the emotion that you went through for all of those years, you know? No, I don't, you know, no, I'm not going through that. I didn't have to go through that, but as a woman, you know, I could only imagine. And just to feel those emotions of, you know, your kids leaving and crying and you can't do anything about it, you know? So I can only imagine how your nights were, you know, when it was visitation time and you was able to see your kids, but then when they left, how you had to get back on track. So did, was that an issue? So once you saw your kids and then, you know, after they left and it took you maybe two days, three days to get back normal because, you know, that took such a toll on you, you know, how was that? It was mentally draining, you know, just emotionally draining watching them go out the visiting room. And sometimes my son would take it much harder than my daughter because mm -hmm. she didn't really understand and they would be walking out and he would be crying and she'd be like, come on, bro, bro, you know, it's gonna be all right. But she didn't understand. Mm -hmm. He was like, he wanted me to come with him. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I couldn't come. So when I, just when I get there, it was just, you know, it's a false sense of reality because you're there with your kids and in your mind, it's like, this is how we used to be together. But now at, the, at three o'clock, we going separate, separate ways, ways, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I, you know, I just feel like I didn't make the best decisions at that time because um, it was so many complications to my case. You know, my lawyer, he had never tried a criminal case before, and I didn't know that going in. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that he never came and set up a defense with me or anything to say, well, you know, this is what we're going to present to the trial, to the jury, or this is what, you know, so in my mind, I'm thinking I'm going home. I'm the only woman on the case. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, like, you know, they're going to cut me loose eventually. Right. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Right. So... You know, with my kids leaving and everything, like, 
you know, I, I, I had to question myself over and over, oh, did I do the right thing? Mm -hmm. You know, did I do the right thing? You know, am I ever even going to get to see him? Because not every day, even though I had faith, I didn't feel like, you know, every day wasn't a good day in there for mm -hmm. me. I didn't wake up like I'm leaving today. Mm -hmm. Some days I would, because you have to tell yourself that, like, oh, you know, freedom is a state of mind. Mm -hmm. And I would tell myself, oh, I'm going here, I'm going there, you know, or I would just stay in the room and curl up in the bed with a book and think about my kids, how they would be walking on the floor with their little onesies on and that kind of thing. So I would kind of like, you know, use my mind to escape that place mm -hmm. and read books to go different places. So I would travel in my mind all over. So I had been to New Orleans a lot of times. Really, I had never left, mm. you know, but uh, I didn't ever tell anybody because people think you're crazy. Yeah, they, they think you're crazy when you start talking like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Mm -hmm. They think like, oh, she tripping. The time getting the best done now. She, mm -hmm. she get it. But. Mm -hmm. but that's what you use. That was your comfort. That's what you use to be able to handle, to do that bid. Like, you know, right. that, that's a strong bid, you know. Right. Um, that, that's, that's really strong. And so, like you said, you use books. You know, what type of books did you like to read when you were in there? Um, any kind of autobiographies, biographies, anything. Like, anything that um, I didn't like to read... Uh, Really, I was mostly into sports and stuff like that because I lived through like uh, famous people. Like I lived through them, like the hardship, like Venus and Serena. I, you know, I watched up from when they won their first match all the way until they got grown. That's how long I was sitting in a prison. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, this I would know all these guys, Kobe and uh, their background, and if you know everything, I was just like intrigued with them because mm -hmm. it's like they, everybody had to overcome something. You yeah. know, like most of them, not Kobe. Not Kobe, really, but the rest of them, like, guys that's just coming in the league, and, you know, that's how it is when you're there. You just consume yourself with that, and I would watch um, 60 Minutes and stuff like that. I love to have a USA Today, you know, like, I would make sure, you know, whoever had the paper, I would be like, put me in line for the paper, because they were expensive. You know, mm -hmm. USA Today, the subscription is, like, $300, and so I would, like, put me in line for the papers. I like to read. But most of the things I would do was write. I love to write, mm -hmm. because writing would be my great escape. And I would always compare myself, like if I see something on TV about somebody getting a little time, and I was like, nah, let me compare that to me mm -hmm. and see why this happened to them and this happened, happened to me. To I had no understanding of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So um, I love to sit in front of the TV room. Everybody know I was in a news and sports TV room daily. Mm -hmm. And you know, when our president, Obama, came, it was like, I got a connection with You got a friend. connection. Because mm -hmm. for one, he was a you know African American. He's mm -hmm. a black man, and he looked like he could be related to me. And um, he came inside the, the jail every evening, so I would run to the TV room mm -hmm. every day, just you know, like don't move my seat. My seat got to be here. Everybody know this was my seat. You know, in prison, you all have a little territory. Somebody owns something, mm -hmm. so that was my seat. And if it be off to the side, I'd be like, uh uh, push my seat back over right here, because mm -hmm. it could be right here, right here, so you yeah. can see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your experiences with the guards. I mean, you know, we see on TV, guards, they treat the inmates wrong. They do them, um, you know, all type of different things. You know, they have some that's good, but majority of them are bad. Um, did you have any of those type of experiences? Well, the guards, for most part, like the ones that liked me, liked me, and the ones that didn't, just didn't. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they have some of them that just feel like you belong there. Mm -hmm. and, um, they would be cruel, some of them would be cruel, or they'd just mess with you to mess with you, you know. But for the most part, they didn't really bother me because they when once somebody just say if you were a guard mm -hmm. and they'll be like, Well, she tired, that's Danielle Mets, don't mess with her, she ain't never going home, you know. If you see her with some extra, you know, another pair of color pants on, just let her have them because she's never leaving. That's Danielle. We kinda use her to set the tone. Because in prison, like when you're a lifer, they like the guards use you to make their job easier because if you you know, you have respect in there. And if you tell them, like, you know, man, don't get this man no problem, or, you know, don't do that, you know, they'll say, well, miss, you know, I'm having a problem with Shatara. Kind of talk to her and see, you know, because I don't want to lock her up, you know. So mm -hmm. I had a, you know, a responsibility in that just because of who I was. Who you, you was know? and the time that you had. Yeah. And some of them was ugly, you know, like I had one, um, just when you'll get a letter and you'll think you're going to go home, like, I will run and say, oh, Mr. Sutton, you know, just Mr. Brown, you know, I'm going home. He was like, Girl, you ain't never going home. You ain't leaving up out here till you leave in the body bag. You know, that's the kind of cruelty they'll just say that. Now, but that would just like make me just crush me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, for real? You know, and then I'll tell another officer who I was cool with. I said, you know what he told me? Mm -hmm. And she'd be like, girl, don't, don't worry about what them people saying. You won't go home. You won't go home. So in there, I became like 
it's almost like they were my family because I, I, I was in there since I was 26 yeah. and I didn't come out till I was 49. So I was like the poster child for Dublin. Like, so anything people wanted, uh, you know, they would kind of say, well, ask them, yeah, she gonna, and I'm like, I can't, you know, they ain't gonna do it for me. But they was like, yes, they will, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But, gotcha, yeah, yeah. So you met somebody when you was in there that helped you to get your GED. Mm -hmm. Um. So tell us about that because you think about it. Sometimes when you're in prison and with the experience, you know, with the the punishment that you had, that could have easily broken you to a sense of you don't want to do anything except sleep your way through, or you know, maybe whatever the case may be. Um, before we get to the GED situation, you know, did you ever contemplate suicide, or did you ever contemplate dying? Or you know, because I know I read that you said um, when they gave you the sentence or when you was in court, you was just like you just felt dead at that moment. Yeah, because that was like a death sentence to me, mm -hmm. you know, like, that's how I felt, but no, I never wanted to not live, you mm -hmm. know, like, I had a will to get out of there, you know, my kids deserve more than that, you know, with all the choices that I made, I had, I owed them the, that much to fight till I get there, so you, you get know, that. I couldn't give up on them, you know, like, they were depending on me, you know, like, they wanted their mother to come home, and I know they were waiting on me, like, you know, it was evident that they were because every time I talked to them, they'd be like, well, mom, when you coming home? Did you hear anything? Uh, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So that let me know they was expecting me any day. Yeah, they so, were. So no, I never thought about nothing like that, you know, for whatever reasons, because when you're in prison, and um, most of the time, if you have issues, like just say if I'm having issues, like I'm having a hard time, they will gladly give you some psych meds. Mm -hmm. But if you were just sick, they wouldn't give you that. But they love to give they you Prozac or Zoloft yeah. or something like that. But I didn't want that, you mm -hmm. know, because I, I, I needed to be same. Uh, right, right, 100%. But where you was going, because right. you knew, you you knew, you had that, that something that was inside of you that just knew that I was going home to my children. You knew you was going to get out and you knew you was going to go home. Um, that's why you just was like, no, I'm going to fight and I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep going until I get to where it is that I'm supposed to go to. I saw a YouTube video that your daughter did and um, it kind of like chills me up a little bit because she was like, you know, people keep saying that they're gonna help, but they're not really helping. You know, you said that she was gonna help and you know, you know, she deserved to be home and you know, she have kids and you know, just the thought of just listening to the things that she said, mm -hmm. it just, it confirmed what you just said about your kids knew you were coming home. Like they believe that without a shadow of a doubt, we gonna see our mom again in the flesh, you know what I mean? Not right. behind those bars, but in the flesh. Right. And so with them believing in it, you believing it, it just was, it was, it was, you know, put in a universe and it was meant to happen, you know? Right. So I just had to get that out. But tell me about the, the lady who you met that helped you with the GED and different things like that. Um, her name was Marilyn Buck. She was a um, part of the Black Liberation Army. Mm -hmm. but. This sister knows so much about our culture. It was just ridiculous, like for real. She knew everything, you know, like she was with the Panthers. She was just well respected, but she was so educated. And we done a poetry slam one time. And when I did it, she said, you really could write. And um, after she said, I want to ask you something. I was like, what's up? And she was like, you got your GED? And I was like, mm-mm. And she was like, I'm gonna help you get it. And I said, okay. She said, Danielle, you really can write. And I said, okay. So she helped me. She would take one hour, two hours a day. Because I, I knew how, you know, math and everything. I'm going to say everything else, reading and all that. I got good comprehension skills. But math, only thing I really want to count is money. You right. Know, the numbers, I don't want to see that. The money, I have no problem counting money. No, real. I have no problem Come counting on. money. Now, the numbers and all that algebra, no. But put the money, I can count the money. You know. So, uh she, she just told me, and I, 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 I love her for that, because she had a lot of issues, and I'll never forget. She, you know, something happened one time, and um, I was telling her, I said, well, I ain't gonna tell on myself, mm -hmm. you know? And she said, well, then yeah, it's about integrity. And I, I didn't understand her too about snitching and integrity. Mm -hmm. I said, well, she said, no, it's a difference. And so she explained that to me, you know, mm -hmm. like, this is what this is, and this is what this is. Just say you did it, and, Go and accept the, consequences, accept the consequences, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, but I didn't understand that. She taught me so many life lessons, and um, just so many people. Of you, you know, know people who've been to Dublin. She's touched a lot of people's lives, and she didn't. Um, she she made it home, but she died a week after she got home. Oh. She had cervical cancer, and you know, like she was looking forward to living her life. Her life, yeah. And she died, and I, I never forget Marilyn for that. You know, she was just. Powerful, mm -hmm. beyond words. Beyond you know, words. Not just her. I met so many people in there, like you know, Griselda Blanca, and 
you know, Sarah what does that name sound like a, a, a ma mafia type name or something? That was like the cocaine cowgirl. Okay. You know, if you ever saw that movie, but she was just, you know, a beautiful person, you know, and you had Sarah Jane Moore and Laura Whitehorn and Denise DeQuagan and Yvonne Johns, you know, they kind of, and Miss Pat Williams, Miss Basie, they raised me, you know, like mm -hmm. these women that had a lot of time, but they took me under their wing mm -hmm. and showed me how to do my time, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I love them for it. I'll never forget them. They're like my real family, you know, mm -hmm. they showed me how to do my time because they dropped so many jewels on me because I, I was supposed to have the attitude like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. It's whatever. It's whatever. Yeah, I got forever in a day. What they gonna do to me? They can't give me no more time. Mm -hmm. You know, but they taught me, you know, my roommate, she would always, she said, sister, it's a game. It's a game. She said, but remember, we play to win. Mm. I'd be like, play to win? She said, sister, you know, she just taught me so much. They taught me so much up in there. You know, just mm -hmm. how to conduct myself, oh, how yeah. to behave, you know, because they end up going. Some of them left and then I became. The one you the have one. to teach others how to conduct themselves. I and became how to the one who mentor people. You mm -hmm. know, I became the mentor, and I'm like, oh nah. So you doing purpose all in? You you doing purpose all in jail? Right. You know your purpose that that you that thing that you were called to. A, a guy was able to use you to be a blessing even while you were in jail. Right. That's amazing. That that's you know that's the that that's the kind of guy we serve. You know you, you tend to think guys you're funny you know but no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and able to allow you to come out and still, you know, operate in purpose. So, you wrote a letter for clemency um, in the first time, and so you were saying how when P President Barack Obama got in office, you wanted to sit and you wanted to watch him on TV, you know, you knew you had a chance, you had a fighting chance, like you knew at that moment, you know, all the other times, maybe not, but at this moment, right. I got a chance. And so right. you wrote a letter before, Right. The and what happened? Term. Mm -hmm. The first term I wrote a letter, my daughter was getting ready to get married. And for some reason, I just told myself that I was going to go home to, I was going to be there for yeah, the wedding. Way. I had really psyched myself up so much that I was leaving. I never felt so strongly. And I had gotten a letter that I was denied. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of broke my heart. Mm -hmm. But it didn't make me really give up because I was like, I got four more years. Because mm -hmm. he you know, like, yeah, four more years. Four more years. Mm -hmm. Then I noticed he started talking about um, reform. Mm -hmm. the justice system, then he did a clemency initiative. And I was like, I didn't fit the criteria because you had to meet a certain criteria. Like if you was a leader, like I had a leadership role, so therefore I couldn't fit the criteria. And um, there's plenty of things that mark me off, but okay. my God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had people all on your behalf, people outside in the outside world, they were um, doing visuals and you know, people were doing uh, videos and people were doing writing letters and um, you had somebody write a letter on your behalf and all of that and then boom Right, you got and, granted. And, but it took all that. You know how they say it took a, it takes a village uh -huh. It took every day because I don't want to never Discredit anybody even if you wrote a letter signed the petition you helped me get out of prison mm -hmm. It's because of you that I'm here that one signature meant that much to me because I, I didn't get to think a lot of people because I didn't really know who did it I mean when they put the thing on about the signatures like in Three days, I had 60,000 signatures. Wow. Like, out of nowhere, I was like, oh, wait a minute, you know? So I have to thank all them people. And sometimes when I'm walking, and um, I guess I look the same way I looked when I was a young girl. And, they, you know, they always say, that's Danielle, that, yeah, you went to Crocker? You went to St. Monica? Because I guess I have the same features. Mm -hmm. And they say, I'm signing your petition. I said, girl, thank you. It's all because of you. Because it is. Mm -hmm. Because it took all that to make this happen, mm -hmm. you know? But God... He placed people where he needs them yes. to be at, you know, because yes. who would ever thought we'd have a black president? And not only that, like, he would even sign my petition. I was the last two people that the he granted to people. A now guy you know, and myself. You know that was from God. Like, it was like, no, we won't let this man leave. He, he purposely did eight years. Regardless of what we may think, he was in office for Danielle. Mm -hmm. If he wouldn't, if you ain't there, nobody don't think him. I believe for nothing else, he was in office for you, for you to get freedom, for you to be able to get back to your kids, like you so strongly believed that you would. Danielle, tell us that feeling you got when the warden called you in the office and showed you that you got Clemson. You got that letter. Did it? How did it happen? Did the warden call you? Did you receive a letter? Like how was it? How did it go? Well, I was, I was in the well. Prior to. That happening, um, you know, I, you get tired of seeing people go like they leave. It's become a revolving door. Like mm -hmm. people just keep going, and you never leave it. You never leave it. You watch people just go. They've even done six years and go home, three years and go home, four years and go home, and you still there. 
So um, I went to a gospel show um, on one Sunday. And my roommate was leaving again. Another roommate was leaving because I always, you know, nobody's going to stay there. Longer than you. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So I always had to get another roommate. She was leaving. I was like, you know what? I'm just tired. And I prayed and prayed. I went to the gospel show. When I went to the gospel, I sat in the back. And when I got back, I didn't want to talk to anybody. And I said, what's wrong with you? What, why you didn't talk? And I was like, I, ain't, I don't have nothing to say. But I was really like feeling like this girl leaving, somebody else leaving me behind, you know. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to be here again, you know. So, you know, it's all, it keeps happening and happening. So I um, went to the gospel show. I cried all that night because the roommate was going to leave. The roommate left that Friday. And I was like, you know what, I'm tired. Like, you know, I'm tired. And I prayed. So I got up that morning. I slicked my ponytail. Like, that was on, on a Sunday. That mm -hmm. morning seemed like a weight had been lifted over mm -hmm. me. Like, I prayed. And I said, God, look, I'm tired. Give, just give me a chance. I can't do it no more. Like, is getting too much for me, everything. You know, my name never on these lists because they had lists that come out with people that was granted clemency. Mm -hmm. And I run to the computer every day and my name was on mm -hmm. I was like, you know what, this got to stop, you know. But I fixed my hair and I went to the kitchen. And I went, for some reason, I just felt relieved. But before that, that Sunday morning, before I went to the gospel show, I had, you know, just imagine being in prison for 23 years and you have all these clothes. Because I was there when we had regular civilian clothes. Mm -hmm. So all that was grandfather and they let me keep mine because I was there. So I was able to help still have my sandals and all my nice boots and stuff that we had when we were able to get, you know, street clothes as they called them. And um, I, I just woke up that morning and my friend knocked on the door and she was like, what you doing? I had a mountains and mountains of sweatsuits, all the stuff people that gave me and left and this. I said, I'm packing my stuff. And she was like, packing your stuff for what? I said, I'm going home. And she was like, girl, go ahead. I said, look, I had a lot of oils, like the- Body oil? Yeah. I said, take whichever one you want. After this, I'm gonna start giving all this junk out. She was like, all right, now tomorrow I'm giving this back to you. <laughs> I said, I said, all right. Cause she, you know, she thinks this is something it's, I'm going through. Yeah, you're going through. And you're I, I don't face. even know, but that's what happens when you speak stuff into existence. Into existence, yes. And I got you up and I said, all I'm taking home is this, this, um, this expansion folders, my kids' picture, and this Bible. I said, everything else I'm, I'm getting rid of. Everything. Because, you know, I had clothes that everybody wanted. And she was like, all right. I said, take whatever you want. And I started giving it away. So the next day, which was that Monday, after I cried and everything, I slicked my hair and everything, I just felt like relieved. I went to work and um, that was Monday. And then Tuesday came, Tuesday morning, I was getting ready because I always get my little contraband for the kitchen because you know you want to stay healthy. I have my tomatoes, onion, bell peppers, all of the stuff I take out the kitchen. And so they called me and I was like, wait, let me put this stuff down. So I went to unpacking my stuff and it was like meds. Um, they want you at the lieutenant office. I said, the lieutenant office for what? You know, mm -hmm. so usually when you, you know, like if something like that happened, if you call to the lieutenant office, people will call you and be like, you want me to get your stuff? What, what you want me to pack out? Because they'll throw your stuff away. Mm -hmm. But I had nothing to pack out because I had already got rid of everything. Yeah, I gave it away. Right. So I didn't have anything. So I was like, okay. I said, no, I'm cool. I said, I'm good. So I got there and it was just, you know, they had done an article on me in a Rolling Stone magazine. And mm -hmm. they said I didn't file a proper protocol for that to take place. But they were blaming me for it. That would happen way in October. So I was like, well, I couldn't let him in the prison, so why, why are you going to put it on me? Why are you going to put it on you? So anyway, the lady, she was just, like, she had done a prank on me. She said, well, you remember the article and stuff? We want to question you about the article. I said, look, I don't want to hear all that. Don't keep asking me about no article because I don't know. Ask the officials. Ask who let him in there. Don't ask me nothing, you know, because now I got an attitude. So she said, we're going to go to the lieutenant office. We went to the lieutenant office. Then we went to the warden complex, and I'm seeing all this commotion. Everybody moving around moving stuff and paperwork being i'm like what is they doing mm -hmm. and i said look miss moore i'm not even i'm gonna be real with you i said i can't pay attention to what you talking about i said because it's too, too much, much going, going on, on. Mm -hmm. and she was like well just be comfortable she said you're not even in trouble or anything i said well i know that you know because i ain't done nothing you know <laughs> like that and she was like okay and i'm seeing all this and they got headsets on and everybody moving and moving so my lawyer called and when my lawyer called he was like um I get on the phone, I said, yeah, they're asking me about this old article that I did. I said, you know, I ain't got nothing to do with that, but I'm not even paying attention that he on the phone. You know, I'm just trying to, you know, defend myself. And so he said, well, where are you? I said, I'm in the warden's complex. He said, are you sitting down? I was like, no, I'm standing up. I said, they asking me all these questions and stuff, you know. He says, well, sit down, take a, just calm down. We're going to take care of all that. And I said, okay, I sit down. He said, well, I went to um, the Department of Justice this morning. And I was like, yeah, you know, because I'm, I'm in another zone right mm -hmm. now. And he was like, well, you know, they granted your clemency. 
And I was like, oh my God, I just felt screaming. All them tears that my mom told me not to cry for 23 years. You cried. It was almost like I had a seizure, like an out of body experience. Oh my God. And I was just yelling and yelling and yelling. I was like, it just was, it was coming from the pit. Yeah. It was coming from the pit. And I was like, it was like, I just passed out like in my mind. And when I came to, like every officer that was in there that was rooting for me, they were up in there. It was like every, the room was just filled to capacity. Oh my God. It was everywhere. And I was just like, you know, the um, ward, he was Nigerian and he was like, uh, he was a Nigerian. So when I, he, I just dropped the phone and he got on the phone with the lawyer and he said, she is out of space. She is out of her mind right now. You have to call back. You have to call back. And so, uh, they just let me. Have yeah, your moment. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you better let you have your moment behind yeah. 23 years, three life sentences plus 20 years. You better let me have my moment. Yeah, and then, you know, people thinking that it's never going to happen, you know. So everybody, when I woke up, it was like I had a, a standing ovation. Everybody was in there. Every officer, every staff, every department head, it was like meds going on. Meds going on. Because I, I remember, I kind of, for the most part, you don't do but 20 years for the government. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have retired, and some of them probably stayed over or whatever, but that was like the max, I think, for them to do, serve that kind of, um, you know, service mm -hmm. for the government. So most of them was leaving, you know. So that one of them, one of my officers, one of the officers there, she would always say, she said, I don't want to leave, I don't want to, you know, she could have been signed and quit, but she said, I want to see you go home. Mm -hmm. And she got to see me go home, and she was like, you know, when, when I kind of came to, she walked me out there, and she was like, you know God is real, huh? Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't want to act like I was excited because I had other life of that was still there, so I didn't want to act like, you know, just shouting all over, but I was like bursting in the inside, mm -hmm. but I had to play it off like, it was like, she must be in shock, but I didn't want to Push it in their face, yeah. you know, like, oh, I'm leaving and you yeah, still gonna be here, because I felt that so many times. Mm -hmm. You know, when people would go home, I would cry, and a friend of mine, she said, you can't get mad because nobody's going on. You got to accept that. I said, I don't have to accept nothing. I can feel like I want to feel. Mm -hmm. I'm hurt. I want to go, too. You know, it was a bittersweet thing. Not that I didn't want them to go, but I wanted my turn to come. Mm -hmm. So when I came out the lieutenant, I'm inside the warden's complex, I just didn't say nothing. I just looked, and everybody was saying, what happened? What happened with me? I wasn't saying that, but everybody knew by then because it was all over the compound. Mm -hmm. And it was just a beautiful thing, you know, to actually see, you know, me get to the other side. I, I was just really happy. Like, um, I had to wait two weeks after that, but it was like, it wasn't like waiting 23 23 years. <laughs> so, so that was the best two weeks of... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was the best two weeks of my life. And I was just, you know, I was still getting up, doing my daily routine, going mm -hmm. to the work, you know, going to the kitchen every morning, but I act like... It didn't bother me, you know, mm -hmm. like, like, but it, when I, when I shut the door, because remember, I didn't have a roommate. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd be praising God up in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'd be having the Holy Ghost dance. But when I come out, I play it off like, mm -hmm. you know, like, I'm all right. It was like, it, have it hit you yet? I was like, y'all ain't hear me screaming and shouting in that room last night? You know, like, I'm praising God for this. You mm -hmm. know, like, I'm going home to see my kids. I'm going to be with my mom. I'm going to be reunited with my family. You know, like, I'm the one that y'all said never was going to get out. Yeah. And I'm getting out. And you get out. Oh my yeah. God, that is amazing. And then you get out. And then I get out. And then how was it when you got out? Well, when I got out, my daughter, she came and um, they had like Vice. I don't know if you know Vice. They filmed me coming from the prison. So they gotcha. had a camera crew from there and they followed me and everything. They saw my exit coming out the prison. My daughter was there. My son, he wasn't there. And I was kind of a little disappointed about that. But um, my daughter, and she said she thought I was going to be nervous. She said, Ma, you're not even nervous. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh-uh. I said, I was used to being free. I would have to get accustomed to being in prison. In prison. I know what this feels like. I went and got me a subway. I got me some nuts. I was all over the place. She said, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, she was more nervous than me. She said, oh, you're so excited. I was like, girl. You know, she was just like, I guess she couldn't believe because she was just staring like, my mom home. My mom you know, home. I left her when she was three years old. Mm -hmm. Three years old. And you she know? had to see you visiting you she had to see you through visitation you know see you through letters or through pictures or you know what i mean like she didn't get to see that so the shock that she had you know um what's the first thing you did when you got out the first thing well they gave me a little party but 
I, I, the first thing I did, well, my mom was waiting for me when I got here, you know. I just told her, I just started crying. And she, my mom, if you see the video on Vice, she was here, my mom saying, what you crying for now? All that's over with, you know. Because my mom didn't believe me. Like, she would give herself, like, 24 hours to be mad about anything, no matter what it was. Death or whatever. She's like, 24 hours, because this guy's real. There's nothing we could do about it. Mm -hmm. So I was crying, and I was just like, you know, like, glad to see her. And I was like, she said, my baby home. Mm -hmm. You know, my baby home. And, you know. I think that probably was the best thing that ever happened to my mom, knowing in that situation mm -hmm. that God made a way, made mm -hmm. it possible for me to get back home, you know. Yeah. And then you went to school. The Dean's List? The Dean's List. The Dean's List? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to think about everything that you went through from, you know, having a baby young, not being able to finish high school from your, uh, the, the father of your kid, the, your, you know, the love of your life being murdered for then you having to go through what you went through and getting this cruel and unusual punishment, getting three life sentences plus 20 years, having to stay in prison for all of that time, have to deal with the mistreatment of guards or whatever you have to go through, you know, because we see stuff on TV. Right. You know, maybe you fighting, maybe you this, maybe you're trying to take it something, maybe you had to do this, you know. So the actual of having to, you know, maintain your life, you know, having to maintain your sanity, having to see your kids and then having them go, not being able to be there, all of these different things that you went through, mm -hmm. you was able to come out right, and go to college. Mm -hmm. And then make the team's list. Mm -hmm. Like you was gone for a very long time. Like, you know, you had to, did you, you had to relearn anything? Like, what was that like, you know? It was intimidating for me, but that's something like, I'm, with me being home now, Everything that I sit and dreamed about, that's what I try to do now. Because I always say I would try to be an advocate. You know, this is what I would do. I would go to school. I would do that. So now that I have the opportunity, like, my future is endless. I can do whatever I say yeah. I wanted to do. So I don't have no boundaries. I'm like, I can do it. You know, I wasn't expecting to make the dean's list. I was just applying myself. You know, going back to school, I was kind of intimidated because, you know, like, when I left, they had phone booths and big old cell phones. Now, you know, little bitty phones and everything, mm -hmm. and, uh, computers, everything computer. You can't even do um, an application unless it's online. online. Even if you bring it in, they say, oh, you got to go back and do it online. Mm -hmm. So everything, and I was like, I, I got to do something, you know, like, I, I, how am I going to survive out here, you know, like, I need to educate myself and get real acquainted with this new society, you know, the social media thing, everything, you know, I'm not really too much into that. Mm -hmm. but. Cause I feel like you know the world know a lot already about me. About you, know, so Google. The bit that I do, you know. Google give but you everything. But then I have to, you know, dispel some of the myths they have about me too. Yeah. So it's my job to tell them who that yell is. Really like, is. is. Yeah. yeah. It's you your know. job to, to tell the truth, to make it truthful about everything. That's really good. So before we get to the fan questions, you know, some fans, um, I put it on social media and asked people, you know, if they had any questions they wanted to ask you. And like I said, my DMs went crazy. So I'm sorry guys, I could not ask, get all of your questions, but I did pick a handful of questions to ask Danielle because I just, it, it just was too many. But before we get to that point, um, being that this, being that this series is on, you know, being uncovered in the unspoken truth and, you know, different things like that, like you have such a, a story, you know, for people to understand, like you, resilience, you never gave up in the face of like, you know, you were faced with life. Like, there was no other way around it. Like, no, you're serving life, period. You know, like, you won't see the outside again. You know, all of the different things you had to go through in your mind, the mind battles and all those different things, but you kept, you kept going. You stayed, you know, flat-footed and you stood on exactly what you believed in. You know, can you just give a little insight to, you know, some people who may be going through something. They may be going through a divorce. They may be going through a sickness. They may have gone through death. They may have gone through, you know, all of these different things and they feeling like, I can't go anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to give up. Life isn't this. You know, you are living proof mm -hmm. that life is everything and more. Right. So what is something that you can give to some people that they can hold on to and they can say, if Danielle did it, I did it. I remember Danielle Metz, you know, when life get tough and I'm ready to, you know, I remember her, her story, what she did, what she went through, you know, her, you know, moving and keeping, keeping moving and shaking. I, you know, what is something that you can help some people out with? Well, basically, I would just tell them never give up no matter what, because um, a friend of mine told me, an older lady, um, me and her still good friends, she said, you know what, Danny, because sometimes I would get down in my spirit, like, when it's going to happen, you know, I just needed to be reassured. She said, well, you know, if you give up, you'll never know what the end result is going to be. Come on. So don't ever give up, because, you know, you giving up, 
Your breakthrough might be tomorrow. Right mm -hmm. Just go, just go through and trust the process because you know, like, even with us, you know, being saved or whatever, life is about you know overcoming triumphs and going through you know the highs and the lows. Yeah. Everything and not gonna be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. even for me, it's not. It wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. But right now, it's like I'm getting to live out the other side of it. I suffered long enough, so now I'm getting you know. The fruits of my labor because hard work pays off. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm going, I'm working two jobs. I'm going, you know, I go to work from eight to five, five to nine. Then I go to school in between that and whatever kind of speaking engagements I can get between that. You know, it's like my niece always say, Lady, sit down. I'm like, I, I jump up in the morning and be at the smoothie center on the bike. They're uh -huh. like, now what is you doing outside? I'm free. Uh -huh. I can do what I want to do. I can do that. I can do that. Uh -huh. If I just want to jump up, I can do that. Uh -huh. Sometimes I would be so happy. I got a hundred thousand miles on my car. They said, where are you going? I say, riding, uh -huh. riding, <laughs> riding from here to uh -huh. there. You know, just just the, the the fact that I can do this now. Uh -huh. You know, so you're not supposed to, um, you know, like. Trust God and challenge him and see that his word is real. Read them, read them scriptures and know that they'll come to pass. Mm -hmm. They'll come to life for you. Because I'm telling you, when I said I was going home, I had no clue I was leaving. When I said that. And mind you, somebody had told me in 2014 that an officer came, got me from my cell and told me that I was on the list to go home. That was in 2014. I didn't go home in 16. I got mad at the officer and everything. I was like, now you could have made me lose my mind telling me I was going home. She said, you don't even believe. Now, I don't know if God told her that, but this two years later. But I'm mm -hmm. like, so I had to ask, I say, hold on. Did God tell you that or did the warden tell you that? Or how, what made you come tell me I'm going home? I called my kids and told my kids I was leaving in 2014. Mm -hmm. And my kids was like, my son asked me, say, hold on. You waiting on the clemency or, you know, do you know? Or how you going home and you ain't got here yet? This 2015 now. We going into 16. So I don't know where she got that from, but maybe... God told her to tell me that, that, you know, my time was coming. Mm -hmm. But had I gave up, then, you know, like, what would I have told them? I didn't mean that much to me to go, you know, to give up on them. I couldn't give up on my kids. And not on that, you know, like, I am a living witness of what God can do. I am a miracle. I don't look at it like that because, you know, when people tell me that, I just be like, oh, okay. But I know. Mm -hmm. I know. So, you know, I try to stay in the middle. I don't want to be too high or too low. I just stay, like, even. Mm -hmm. You know, when they say, this hit you yet or that hit you yet, I'm like, look at me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm here, so I have no time to even, you know, I don't want nobody to give up. I have time, I don't have no time for bitterness, for none of that. Like, I'm living. That's all, you know, I'm too worried about living. I didn't miss 23 years 23 of my years. life. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, even in there, my daughter, she had two miscarriages, and that was like my lowest point. Mm -hmm. um, when my daughter, they told my daughter she could never have a baby. I have a brand new, well, she's not brand new, she's 16 months, a bouncing baby girl named Victory. And I mean, they say she couldn't have a couldn't baby. Have a baby. Mm -hmm. So God, you know, everything is in his time, mm -hmm. in his time. So, you know, I just tell him, don't ever give up. It's easy for me to say, but I'm, I'm proof that you shouldn't. You shouldn't give up. You shouldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, just use, if, if that's what it takes for you to use me as an example, then grab on to that. And know that it's gonna happen for you too. Mm -hmm. Whatever you know, I just, you know, I just be like amazed at myself sometimes. Like sometimes I have to when I'm riding all these lengthy trips, going back and forth, running out my gas and just putting more gas in there. I just put to the side and like, Lord, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I start crying like for real. Like mm -hmm. it hit me. People don't know. They don't know because they just see the day. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they see what's presented in front of them. Right, mm -hmm. right. But they don't know they don't how I feel. Them. Yeah, because. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I've mentioned that to you, but several months after I came home, yeah, I did that my mom passed. And that was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I keep hearing her voice and she said, you know, boo, you gonna be all right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I never knew what life was, you know, without her. And um, she told me I'm gonna be all right. And I'm like, okay. And I, I think I'm doing fairly well for myself, you know, just making a way, you know, because I've never had a job before. But it's paid off. I love getting my check, you know, on Friday mm -hmm. and smiling. Like, this, this, this is the real life, you know. Uh -huh. This is what it is, you know. Uh -huh. and, you know, I don't, I'm not envious of nothing that anyone else has. Because some of my friends, uh, they, you know, they got homes and everything, but they work for that. Mm -hmm. And that's their hard work paying off. So I'm going to have it's all that, turn. too. Yeah. I'm going to have all that, too. Yeah. So, if you, you know, if you do it right the first time, you don't have to do it twice. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's what I stress to the kids, you know. They think that. 
their parents are, are not their best friends. But in the end, your parents want the best for you. Mm -hmm. I wish I had to listen to mine, you know, because I'm like 23 years of just sitting in a visiting room. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't cool, you know. Yeah. That, that hurt it more than anything because I know how that woman, you know, the sacrifices she made for me. Mm -hmm. But I want to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. So here are some fan questions. The first one is, where did Miss Metz get her strength from? I get it from my mama. Mm -hmm. I get it from my mama. She get it from her mama. They had a song, you get yeah, it from your mama. mama. That's what they said. <laughs> got it from my mama. Mm -hmm. She got it from her mama. But my strength comes from God, you know. Mm -hmm. But my mom, she demonstrated that every day. You know, mm -hmm. like my mom would get on the handlebars of a bike to get to her job. Like, and, and just say, if I brought you to the house, that's what I love about my mama. She was, you know, she was real. Like, I, I just said, oh, that's your tower. She said, well, where's your tower work? Mm -hmm. I said, oh, she don't work. She said, don't bring her back to my house. Because she didn't want to be in there. Whatever y'all got going, don't bring don't her bring back. Uh -huh. like, you had a job. And I said, well, she, oh, she's tired of work. Mm -hmm. All right? Because she loved that. Mm -hmm. You know, she feel like everybody need a job. Mm -hmm. You know, she, that was her way. It wasn't no easy way. We wanted yeah. the easy we way. We wanted the easy way, yeah. Well, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Another question is, did she ever believe she would ever be released? Which you answered that already. You right. Said you knew you was going to be released. You believed that you spoke it, you manifested. Um, how did her kids take her being locked up? Mm. Did they resent you? Did they have any type of... No, they didn't resent me because I think in the early years, the formative years, I made a good, you know, was a good parent. Mm. Because I never, before I had went to prison, I had never been in a club before. Mm. I had never been in a club. Well, I went to the famous one time. And other than that, I had never been in a club. I didn't drink or anything like that. So, you know, I had never been in a club. Even when I came home, I was uncomfortable because it, it's like too many people were, you know, but they didn't know that was never my setting. Now, I like the high school dances, like the Superdome dance, and that was my thing. Because remember, I went from like 18 years old to dealing with a grown man. Mm -hmm. and, you know, clearly I was out of my league. But, you know, you think you can, you know, you're you on that level. Yeah, you think like, okay, I can do this, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So clearly I was out my league, but... Yeah. Okay. Um, how many friends do you have from back then? How many friends do you still have today from back then? All my friends are still my friends. Oh, wow. From then. All from, my all, friends. From then. They, and I still get with them, you know, I love them to death. They still my friends, my childhood friends. Some of them have been friends since we were seven or eight years old. And we still friends. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Well, to be honest with you, those are the people that I'm most comfortable, comfortable around. Comfortable around. Yeah. I, I feel out of place when I'm not around them. Like, I, if I go to a party or somewhere, I'm not, and somebody else invite me, I don't feel the same way I feel around them because mm -hmm. they know me, know me, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. How has she adjusted to society? I think I adjusted pretty well. Two jobs? Right. You doing speaking engagements? You got some other good things, big things in the works that I'm going to let you talk about, you know. Mm -hmm. So I would say you adjusted well, too. You've been out for what? Since 2016? Mm -hmm. Almost three years. Almost three years. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You're looking good and you look like money, you know. So I would say you adjusted very well. What was your lowest point? In there. I was in there. there. With my the daughter. miscarriages with your daughter? Yeah, because mm -hmm. I know she wanted, to, she wanted to know what it felt like to have a parent. Because one time she kind of broke my heart. We were in there, she said, how do you look when you wake up in the morning? And that just told me down because I was like, she never really, un she never got Saw to you. see me wake up. Mm -hmm. She said, do your hair be all over your head in the morning? I was like, what? And she was like, how you look? How you look in the morning time? And that just broke my heart. Oh my. So I know she wanted to feel what it felt like to be a mother and be in that family atmosphere. Because she didn't, my sister raised her and my mom did the best they could with her, but she didn't get to have that mother Motherly. thing. Mm, that's deep. Mm -hmm. That's really deep. Was you ever afraid in prison? Mm -hmm. No. When I first after I, when I first got there, I think it was uh once that door locked on me, it was like I'm in here now. You know, I wasn't really afraid because when I got there, it was like you had different groups. You had like your TLCs. It's, it's kind of an illusion when you get there. They make you think that uh, federal prison is all that. 
but prison is prison. Mm -hmm. And that time we had our clothes, we could wear our clothes, and you had all the different groups. You had TLT, SWV, all the people, you know, pretending to be who they, and they, they be dressing, them girls be looking good, you know. Oh, okay, that, that was, I'm trying to, I was trying to give where you was going, TLC, you mean in like the group TLC, yeah, in the yeah. SWV group, the singing group. Right, Okay. Right. okay, okay. so when I got there, I was like, well, what's going on here? All these girls, they fly, got it going on, and you know, I'm like, wow. So, you know, it wasn't really nothing to be afraid of. Gotcha. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. How was your transition from um, prison to freedom? Any challenges? No, because you know, um, really I came out here and I just applied myself and like I say, hard work pays off. So I didn't really have a lot of challenges because people, uh, I had a good supporting cast when I came home. Mm -hmm. um, people took me where I needed to go, get my, all the things that I need, my identification. They put me on the right path. Now everybody don't have that coming out of prison, but I did. And so um, I was able to get a job. Then from a job, I got a promotion. Then I got another promotion. You know, I got recognized by the mayor for being, um, what would I say, uh, the service person of the year where I was complaining about doing boxes. I would be stunting like, baby, I ain't gonna be doing no boxes. They got me mixed up. And when I get inside there, I make a thousand boxes. You mm -hmm. know, I have a minute, I can't make that day. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just came out here and started applying myself. Mm -hmm. And then I saw, you know, progress being made. And then I said, I can do this, and I can do that, and I can do this. You know, my plate is full, but I like it like that because it makes me uh, stay focused, mm -hmm. you know. It makes me know that um, whatever I want, I can have. Yeah. I believe that. You believe you know? that? I believe that. Yeah. I know one thing I read about that you had a challenge with, and that was technology. Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. That, that scared me. <laughs> yeah, but I took, a, I took a computer system class uh -huh. and, uh, when I went to... Um, sooner mm -hmm. and that scared me and I ended up getting an A in there too because I was like it just scared me because when I was in there because I was a lifer they wouldn't allow me to take the classes I would be like the last one or sometimes I wouldn't even get in there because they figured you're not going, you're not home. going home what, what you do you need, need that for home? yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes okay did you ever just want to die like really like mean it and no. you said that to me earlier in the interview no you never wanted to die you knew you had to get home to your kids I um, mean, you knew that you were going to get home to your kids, and so that's what it was. Um, any regrets? Mm, what about when, when I came to prison? Well, if I had to do it all over again, I probably, well, again, my lawyer, he wasn't equipped to handle the kind of case that I had. But um, right now, no, I have no regrets. So, you know, back then I probably would have been like, yo, if they had a deal to offer me 20 years or whatever, but I, no one said, well, then, yeah, we offer you 20 years. I heard that from a co-defendant when my lawyer should have informed me, like, we got a deal if you sign for this, you know, that kind of thing could happen. Because I later found out during my clemency process that I wasn't supposed to even be sentenced. They had incorrectly sentenced me. Mm -hmm. That was wrong, but the judge was like... Gonna make an example out of you. Yeah, and not only that, he was an... Um, a light, he had a lifetime appointment, and I didn't know anything about that. Like, when you have a, life, you have a lifetime appointment, you can come off the bench or retire and come back. Come so back. whenever I fill out a paper or I file something, he would come and I didn't understand. I said, how he keep? I thought he retired. But it's a lifetime appointment. Mm -hmm. So he would always come back and deny me. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Do you believe that this was God's will for your life? Now, yeah. I couldn't see it. You know, it's always, um, you know, this, like, you know, they say the rainbow. This the rainbow mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I believe that like just the way everything come together for me and um, it's just a trip. You know, God have he he, he really trips me out. God is funny. I'm like, telling you, I talk to people he, all the time. He has a God system. is very funny. Okay, yeah. he's really funny. He's really funny. Just recently in April, I was um, selected to be the. Um, the role model of the year for the city of New Orleans out of the re-entry. And um, someone was telling me about, you know, talking to different people. And I said, you can't tell me what to say. I ain't no role model. You don't tell me what to do. I talk to who I want to talk to, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I said some awful things, you know, just vent. And so I'm in the library getting ready to do my homework. And the phone rang. And when the phone rang, I said, hello. And they said, hi, this is such and such from the mayor's office. Um, is this Danielle? And I was like, yes, this is me. And um, what's going on? She was like, well, we have um, selected you the role model of the year. And I'm like, and the person I was arguing with, she looked, she said, who that was on the phone? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. 
hear about like Jesus when you think, uh -huh. you, you think and it, that's God. Yeah. You know, showing me that I have something planned for you. Mm -hmm. Your plans. Or not my plan. Oh, not my plan. Yes. And you would have never imagined that that would have been the plan. You know, you, at 25, you, you have so much life ahead of you. You would have never thought that you would have to do 23 years for, for God's will to be done in your life. And, you know, I say this a lot, and I just believe it wholeheartedly that um, God gives these different lives to the people he know he can ha that can handle it. He could he wouldn't give me 23 years in prison cuz I don't I don't think I would be able to handle it. But you, he knew that, you know, you can come out and you can be an inspiration to people and you can help reform other people and you know, you was in there and you got what you needed to get and now you can be a vessel that he can use for his glory. Right. Um so we, I know you got some stuff going on, so you have speaking engagements. Um, how can people reach out to you to do speaking engagements? You have a, what about, you have a book, you have, what's going on? Tell us what you have coming out I for the a, people to get. Okay, I have a book coming out. Um, I had to push the date back, and it's called My Life, My Journey, My Victory. Hmm. And that victory is not like I conquered this situation, but my granddaughter. Gotcha. So that's the catch there. That's, that's what that means. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just the journey from where I started until now. I had initially wanted to write the book like I was writing it to President Obama. That's how I know we connected. Because I wrote, I changed, I was gonna write a hood book, but then I said, you know, I can't write a hood book and um, put that out there in the world and I'm being a mentor and I wanna be an inspiration because we gotta watch what we tell our kids, mm -hmm. you know? So I have to be mindful of that. So I changed the book, but I still have the other one. Mm -hmm. But I was like, you know, I'm gonna write this one and I'm gonna write it specifically to the president. Mm -hmm. And um, I started writing it, and um, I'm completing it. It's, it's in completion. And I was just thinking, I said, you know what? That's how I know men this man is connected because even when I want to write the book and he ended up writing me a letter after I made the dean's list, I was not expecting it. Yeah. You know, like, that's all God God, doing. yeah. So I have the book, and I have um, a documentary coming out called Commuted. Mm -hmm. And um, it's about my life, and my life, you know, really is showing the redemption side. You mm -hmm. know, what happened after prison, you know what I'm doing in it, you know, everything with my kids and my granddaughter and everything is, um, it's going to be out in 20, 2020, mm -hmm. it's going to be Next out year. in 2020, yeah, mm -hmm. and so, um, in fact, uh, it won at the uh, black media, public media thing out in uh, New York, mm -hmm. it, won, it won, it was number one, oh, wow. and um, you can uh, probably look it online, look at it online, and I have that coming out, and um, I'm going to have a clothing line. Come on. Yeah. But mine is just going to be like uh, loungewear. Okay. You know, just because when I was in prison, I always think about, that makes sense. you know, I want to be free and I would always put myself in that mindset that I was free. So it's just going to be like loungewear, like the dolphin show, stuff that you would just lounge, lounge around, around in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we're yeah. going to find your book. How long? When will you, you, we got what? Your book will be out within the next two months or so? Two months. Mm -hmm. Two months. Tops. Two months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you gonna get some good, some good secrets in that book. You gonna be you put oh, some. I'm putting it all out there. You putting it all out there. You know how LeBron and do put it all on the floor. Uh huh. I'm putting it all on the floor. Ooh. I'm putting it all on the floor. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know that book is not about me being vindictive or anything about anything that happened in my past, but it's about my healing. Your healing. Because people don't know uh, the scars that I have because of the situation. They just see this Danielle. You know, it's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain, a lot of trauma. I've been through a lot, you know, but I count it all joy, though. Yeah. You know, but I've been through a lot. You know, I don't look at it when I, even when I, I was talking to my son just yesterday, and I was like, something happened with him and I when he was a kid, and I could have been dead then. And I told him what he knows about it, and he was like, man, mom. And I was like, yeah, but God spared me then. You know, like, mm -hmm. it's certain things you push, you push a lot of stuff in the back of your head. Yeah, you do. And when... Stuff happened, that's when you realize, oh, that happened to me, and I could have been, you know, that could have been me, or, yeah. you know, you just never know. Mm -hmm. You never know. So it's a lot of things that you're going to know once the book come out about Danielle, and then you can kind of identify, because it, it's really heart-wrenching. Mm -hmm. It's really heart-wrenching, you know, like, but it's real. Yeah. It's, re it's my truth. Your truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm excited about that. I can't wait to get that book. Mm -hmm. Like, literally can't wait to get that book. Mm -hmm. So we have loungewear coming. We have a documentary coming. We have a book coming. Anything else we have coming up from Danielle? Well, just now I'm just doing speaking engagements mm -hmm. and um, going places. And um, I hope to take my, my book inside the schools and uh, educate the kids through my experience. And uh, that's about it for right now. But 
You never know. You never I might know. have to call you and say, Shatai, you got to put me back on that day. I got a lot more things that I need to be doing. Yes. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And then I'm proud of you too. Thank you. Know, you. I always want to be up for my sister. You know, I never got the opportunity to meet you, but when I saw your sister friend, and you know, sister friend told us, we got to do a sisterhood thing. So mm -hmm. when you called me and asked me, I was like, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, I do that. I don't you have a problem with did. that. You know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm honored to do that because that's what we need to do, have a sisterhood and help each other. You know, like, a lot of people think, like, we're at the bottom in New Orleans, but we're really on the top. Yeah, we're on the top. We're on the top, yeah. Because mm -hmm. when they come here, some of my girlfriends came from L.A. And, um, in fact, one of my girlfriends down here now, she brought her daughter to Dillard. She dropped off, and I'm going to be like... Her parent, her guardian, mm -hmm. and um, she said, "Girl, it ain't no place like this place here." Mm -hmm. And I was like, "It ain't like LA." She said, "It ain't like Miami." She said, "New Orleans got it going <laughs> got on." Got it going on. Late last night, she on the phone calling me about one twenty. I said, where, where are you at? She said, tell me where to go by the orange store to get that shrimp sandwich. I said, girl, you better go inside. That's what you do. <laughs> but they love the city. Uh -huh. They love the city. Uh -huh. And I, I host them when they come down because it's like, this is my city. Yeah. And I'm going to put on for y'all. Uh huh. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, my God. Thank you so much, Danielle, Thank for you. coming on, sharing your truth, Thank for you. talking to us, sharing with Thank the you. viewers so people can get an inside look on you and who you are and what you had to go through the mindset and the mentality just for helping them to see that they can too right. you know they overcome. can overcome they can overcome you know even though you look so good on the outside and i was just telling you, your skin is beautiful you're glowing you. your hair i mean you're beautiful it don't look like you did 23 years in prison you know right. but just because you look a certain way it doesn't mean that that's not you know it's not on the inside right. that you haven't been through anything you know right. and the fact that you you did it we can do it Right. So thank you so much for coming thank on the you. show. I appreciate you thank so you. much. Thank We're going to be following your story. We're going to be buying up all your merch. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> thank you, guys. Until thank next you. time.